Okay, so hi everyone, my name is Maxwell Tsao. Um, we're presenting on zero collateralized, zero collateral decentralized loans. So if you don't know what that means, I think zero collateral means credit card, decentralized means blockchain. Okay. So let's repeat the topic again. <laughs> repeating the topic again, uh, uh, but let's talk about the main ideas behind the project. We, if you think of most common centralized zero collateral loans, so credit card systems across Visa, MasterCard, things like that, they tend to charge pretty significant fees and are often inaccessible. So this is might not be significant to you in the range of two, three percent every time you make a transaction, but that's actually really damaging to a lot of small businesses, a lot of um, people that use the system, and they're also often inaccessible to people of lower incomes and uh, things of that nature. Uh, blockchain networks have the potential to remove middlemen from the system, so taking out these transaction networks that charge high fees for um, all these transactions. But the problem is most blockchain loan systems at the moment are collateralized, meaning that you must put up money against your loan, and their trust systems are underdeveloped, trust systems being like credit scores, things of that, that nature. So my process uh, has changed from my original intention, but it turned into first uh, a section of research on techniques for zero collateral lending over blockchain, followed by simulations to test viability under different conditions for these kind of systems. Um, I did next steps instead of the, uh, what is the, the results, but uh, results pretty much are the process and the simulation, and the next steps are the improved simulation and also look at um, existing behavior in blockchain. So uh, I'm first gonna go into some theoretical background. So this is the first half of the project. Uh, and I'm gonna look at mostly three things. First, market efficiency. So this centrally centers around the efficient market hypothesis, which is the question, can blockchain markets self-regulate themselves? Can they on their own find an equilibrium that is zero collateral and effective for both lenders and borrowers? Then you wanna look at game theory underpinnings. So the idea of what choices are made in any loan system that enable um, you know, zero collateral loans to work. Are there any ways we can set up this game to make it um, effective for everyone? And finally, identity and credit systems, I think is the most important, but how can we introduce trust into a by nature trustless system? Okay, so the future market hypothesis states that like if you, know, you have accurate information, everyone has the same information, you will always get the correct pricing and get, the, and, um, get the, a good outcome in the long run. Problem is, uh, crypto markets are not necessarily efficient. So uh, let's look at the most broadly used um, cryptocurrency, which is Bitcoin. Even Bitcoin pricing fails to match you know, um, some technical math things, but in general, it's not uh, considered efficient, which means un it's unlikely that any other crypto market is efficient on its own, meaning that we can't rely on the market to self-regulate, at the moment at least. Um, so I took a look as well as the game theory dynamics. Um, there's a lot of ways to look at this that I look into. You can look at evolutionary game theory, so how do people reach different equilibriums in these kind of loan games over time, uh, as well as for looking at the formal definitions of um, a credit, credit lending. Thankfully, there's actually a lot of research on this game theory background. Um, one interesting idea that I, I found what in how to guarantee positive outcomes for a creditor is to have something called um, decreasing collateral, which essentially means that, like in the first rounds, you pay up, put up a lot of collateral, and over time, you decrease the collateral such that with the added interest, you don't ever, um, you could never take out more money from the system that you added in. And I can get into technical details and questions. Um, and that's just a little chart talking about the, the basic structure of a, a simple loan game. So um, I think most importantly, I looked at trust and reputation dynamics. As I'll get into in a second, these are, this is really the underpinning of any zero collateral system, is whether or not you can trust an individual to pay back your loan and expect them to do it over time. There are different ways to do this on-chain. You can look at um, on-chain credit, so analyzing the history of any given wallet and deciding whether that's trustworthy or not. There are a lot of providers for this. I've listed some of them on the bottom. Um, but you know, you have cold start issues with new borrowers. You also have unknown predicted value at the moment. Um, you can also do off-chain credit. So this is just doing using pulling information from existing credit providers and or incorporating it on-chain. Um, and there are people that are trying to do this, but at the moment it has not yet been implemented. A robust identity and credit system would allow existing loan systems to be transferred on-chain. In my opinion, this is the most viable solution as it, you know, it gets rid of a lot of intricacies of you know, the behavior of blockchain and simplifies it down to having a good, trustable credit system. Okay. So there's a write-up on the techniques that are available here. And let's go more into the credit simulation which they use to um, get the proof there. For some background, I originally wanted to implement a protocol to do zero collateral lending. Um, but after some discussion with my mentor and some over time, I realized that this actually wouldn't help my goal that much. There's a lot of people that are trying to create like purely zero collateral markets or trying to create uh, protocols that help solve this. 
But the problem is they're not very popular because they're not trustable, they're not proved. We have to then trust in a trustless system and it's not great. What is more useful is to look at showing under what conditions can a zero collateral loan over, uh, over blockchain be effective for creditors, for borrowers, and what does it take to make that happen? And that's more useful to the goal of my project. So in general, uh, I've mapped out a simulation for different rounds of borrowing. And more or less, um, to match like blockchain behavior, you have a creditor, which is the, the lender, making a proposal for what kind of loan they want to give out, what parameters, followed by the borrower taking that loan or not taking it. And then borrowers will choose to then consume, spend money, whatever, eventually paid back or not. And then we can then look at updating the credit so looking at whether or not we still trust them after that point. Um, in the current iteration, we have strat static strategies, meaning that people make the same kind of choices each time based on their um, underlying preferences. And we'll get into the preferences a little bit here. For creditors, it's pretty trivial. It's just, I want to make a lot of money with the least amount of risk, right? So that's pretty simple to map out. For borrowers, it's a little more complicated because both people's behavior is difficult, but also um, how do you think about why do people choose certain loans? Why do people return a certain amount of money on their loans? And I kept it simple, simple as, as simple as I could. Um, if you don't have an economics background, you might not understand what any of this means, but these are utility functions, and they're called log utility functions. So for example, if you look at the loan preference for honest borrowers, so this helps them decide what loan they want to choose in any given round of a game. That equation basically means they want L being the size of the loan, I want to take the biggest loan that I can and pay the least interest. So I really I like having a, a, a lot of money, but I really don't want to pay interest. That's what it's saying. And for an honest borrower, they also care about, could I probably pay this back, right? Is that within my ability? For dishonest borrowers, they really don't care about interest because they're not going to pay back. It's the center of it. Uh, similar things for consumption. Uh, you value uh, consuming in the current period, but you also value having wealth in the future, right? And you also want to for an honest borrower, be able to pay back the loan after cons consumption. Okay, so then I ran a simulation and I looked at different conditions for um, the amount of honest borrowers in a system, as well as you know having a, credit, a good credit system. And if you have you know even uh, basically under any conditions of the amount of honest borrowers, if you have a good credit system, you will eventually weed them out over time, and you will eventually reach an equilibrium where people will start to make back, make back their money over many periods. Underpinning that is you need to have a good credit system. So if you notice, um, the uptick in pricing, sorry, um, there's a little bit of pop noise there, um, of when you start making money is around 90 to 95% of the pool being determined of what they, whether a good or a bad borrower. And this is actually probably the, I'm not sure if I can prove this mathematically, but it's, it seems to be inverse of the interest rate. So I have like a six, 7% interest rate for the loans in the current, uh, current simulation. Um, so if you don't have any credit scores change though, uh, you know, you, you, it's really hard to have a good um, credit system. You need to have like between 90 and 95% honest borrowers with some randomness, which is really difficult to achieve in any given loan market. Um, so again, this just again highlights the importance of having a strong credit score system, which is why I advocate for the on-chain incorporation of off-chain credit or a good and provable on-chain on credit determinant. Uh, determinant. Yeah, so I can have the simulation code and raw data there. I'll also be adding an extra write-up for that in the coming weeks. Uh, next up, I want to introduce more complex behavior to the simulation, whether it's be varied actors for both the borrowers as well as the creditors um, in chain and, and how that affects the credit. And then after graduation, so these things are, so this is after the end of the quarter, I'm hoping to take some time looking to collateralized loans on, on, on blockchain. So looking at how, if we use like, for example, the whatever methodology for calculating on-chain credit, can that you know, predict future behavior? How does collateralized behavior give insight into uncollateralized behavior? So yeah, advice for next year, uh, be a little bit less ambitious. I had a really broad and awesome proposal goal of like I was gonna solve uh, zero collateral lending in, in the world and of course I didn't do that. Um, so think of what the minimum goal that is still interesting and valuable to other people. And that's really what I, I think the next class should, should focus on. In that vein, be flexible. Do what you can as long as it remains within your goals. Uh, as an engineer, I had a lot of action paralysis. I spent a lot of time drawing designs that didn't end up being useful to me. So kind of just start doing things and then act, think like a researcher, not an engineer. Um, <laughs> uh, finally, decide whether you want to do an investigation. 
implementation or proof. So explaining this, investigation, just getting background info. So for example, um, Mises research, that's the investigation. Implementation, so thinking about like, can you make a tool out of this? So for example, that would be more like what Priscilla did. Or a proof, proving that this works under any scenario, which would be kind of what like Jaha did. So um, you can really only do one or maybe two of these. Trying to do all three of them is just not viable for a part-time researcher over the course of nine months. So, all right, uh, thank you for your time. Yeah. Why is it that that is inefficient? We take the, not for granted. We take that the others are also inefficient. So, our efficiency uh, is based on two things, which is volume, as well as the amount of information and access to information. In general, I would think that blockchain markets are again. I, I can't prove this because there's not enough research on market efficiency as well as all blockchain um, products, but. Bitcoin by far is the most coverage, most information publicly available to everyone. So the most even information in terms of the blockchain markets, as well as it has the highest trading volume by far. So in which case, if this one doesn't still can, and it can achieve like accurate pricing in an efficient market, it's unlikely that other things with less volume, less information, and less even misinformation could possibly be efficient. So the question is, what is the way your model was set up? Um, you didn't have uh, the ability for the uh, borrowers to see it on their type. Um, so, in the beginning of the simulation, everyone, there's no knowledge of what type of borrower they are. Right. Over time, in a present system, you could begin to like introduce, try to figure out if they're dishonest or honest based on whether or not they return money in the past. Um, if you, by talking about deceiving, is something I'm trying to introduce in the future, which means like I'm going to pay back a little bit of a loan to make it seem like I'm trying to pay back that kind of sauce, that kind of trickery is what I think you might be getting at. Well, there's multiple, like there's people who honestly are not quite worthy because they just want to pay it back that they can't. Yeah. And then there's people who will try to see the, the lender and take out multiple loans that they had that they just have yeah. to establish in effect. Yeah. And we'll try to maximize how much they invest in. Mm -hmm. And so you aren't able to tell the second one at all, right? So this is, this is basically at the moment, it's, you, you can't tell the difference between like a person who's between those two, those two type of actors. Yeah. Um, that's a general problem with credit systems. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But also, you're not able to tell when an honest buyer becomes a dishonest buyer given certain circumstances that they may experience, yes. or, or yes. vice versa. Absolutely. But I think from the perspective of a creditor or like any sort of money market, if someone becomes dishonest and over time we find out they're dishonest, it doesn't really matter too much about their history. That, that could happen, yeah. uh, so, so can you just really summarize uh, summarize your conclusion again? If you have credit scores that you're putting onto the chain, you sort of have credit scores for your wallets. What was the conclusion? How how what does the interest rate have to be, and what percentage of people have to be honest in order for things to work, or does it? So it, it's more the inverse of the two. So if you have if you have um, if you have credit scores that achieve some ninety five percent of people that lend money to will be, at, will be honest and try to pay you back, then I the interest rate equal to that amount that, that is not covered is more or less what I found in my simulations. Five percent. Five percent for ninety five percent. Ten percent for ninety percent. That kind of thing. And this would be you have like, credit scores. Assuming you have a credit scores that can accurately determine over time over many rounds. Who is honest or dishonest? If you don't have credit scores, then then you just need a, you you have to have a high enough interest rate to cover what is the actual proportion of dishonest borrowers. Oh, like ninety five percent. Yes. Or, yeah. or or whatever or five, whatever it is. Well, how is it different? If, oh, if because what? we because um, because we I think it's like really unrealistic to expect 90, 95 percent of borrowers in the to be completely honest. I see. So like you'd have to charge like forty percent interest if you have two thirds of people, which is not obviously not viable for this kind of so the higher the interest rate, the more dishonest borrowers you attract. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, what, no, it's the other no, way around. No, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. The other way around. Yeah. Uh, the, the lower the interest rate, the more dishonest borrowers you attract. That's right. So we wait. Thank you.